Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So for today's video, we're going to be talking about the 1997 romantic comedy Addicted to Love. This is obviously not a science fiction film, but the main character is an astronomer, and there's this one scene in particular that involves a lot of astronomy, most of it bad. If you haven't seen the movie and don't mind spoilers for a movie that debuted when the Clinton administration was in office, the plot goes like so. Sam, played by Matthew Broderick, is an astronomer at an observatory dating his childhood sweetheart school teacher Linda, who is played by the late Kelly Preston. She leaves to do a fellowship in New York City, during which he meets a suave French chef named Anton, played by Chucky Calio, and he dumps Sam. He races to New York to try to win her back by spying on her from a nearby abandoned building, and finds an unexpected ally in Anton's ex fiance Maggie, who is played by Meg Ryan. Hijinks into Sam and Maggie fall in love, etc., etc. Now, I'll admit I was not a fan of this movie when it came out. Several people who knew me said that they liked it because the character of Sam was kind of like me. I think that was meant as a compliment, but I, it hit me the wrong way when I first saw it and I didn't like it. To prepare for this video, I watched it again and it's okay. I'm still not a huge fan. The characters are very childish. Um, it's really still about two deranged stalkers trying to break up a couple. It can't decide whether it wants to be a black comedy or a romantic one. I don't hate it, but it's not very memorable. The only thing it really has going for it is that it's impossible to dislike a movie with Meg Ryan. Anyway, the astronomy. Let's go to the very opening scene. every half pulse at a regular interval. Let's move to right ascension 23 hours, five minutes. All right, stop the tape. They're using an observatory during a day. There are very few things you can do with an optical telescope during the day. Radio telescopes you can use during the day, optical telescopes not so much. They'll explain what they're looking at in a moment, but uh, it's already kind of unusual. Out here, Alpha Orionis is going super deep. Sometime in the next 100 million years. Thursday. Excuse me. Thursday. It's going supernova Thursday. Alpha Orionis, better known to the world as Beetlejuice, is a massive red supergiant that will in fact one day go supernova. Its classical name comes from the Arabic for Hand of Orion. Alpha Orionis is just a more technical name that means it's the brightest star in the constellation of Orion. If you know where the constellation of Orion is, you can see this as a bright red star in his hand. Let's explain what they're talking about here. For most of their lifetimes, stars burn hydrogen into helium. What happens is you have this massive star and this crushing weight of all the star at the center. That creates enormous temperature and pressure, and eventually that temperature and pressure will get so high, the hydrogen atoms, stars are mostly hydrogen, will start smashing together and they will create helium. Mass is converted into energy. This generates energy to push back against gravity and stabilizes the star. For most of its lifetime, it will continue to burn hydrogen into helium. That will last about 10 billion years for a star like the sun and about 10 million years for a star like Betelgeuse. However, eventually that core is gonna run out of hydrogen fuel and that contraction will resume. When that happens, the star will swell up and become a red giant. The core will heat up and heat up and heat up and about 100 million degrees it is hot enough for helium atoms to start smashing together and creating carbon and oxygen. This will stabilize the star again, but only for a little while. Eventually, it will run out of helium fuel and start contracting again. Now, for most stars, that's where the story ends. Eventually, a quantum mechanical pressure we call the electron degeneracy pressure will stop the contraction of the star. The outer layers will drift away and you'll be left with that hot, small core, maybe about the size of the Earth and several million degrees on the surface, we call a white dwarf. And eventually that will cool off and fade away. That's the fate of most stars, including the Sun. For massive stars that are, say, more than eight times the mass of the Sun, and Betelgeuse is about 11 times the mass of the Sun, that process continues. That quantum mechanical pressure isn't enough to stop the contraction. So it keeps contracting and then carbon and oxygen ignite and start burning into magnesium. It contracts again. Magnesium burns into silicon. It contracts again. Silicon burns into iron. Iron, however, is the last step. When the star contracts and tries to stave off gravity by fusing iron atoms into heavier elements, that's a mistake because that doesn't create energy that absorbs it. And instead of holding off that contraction, it accelerates it. 
in a fraction of a second, the entire stellar core implodes from maybe the size of the Earth to the size of a small city. When that happens, the outer layers crash down, rebound, and create an explosion that at its peak can outshine an entire galaxy. That is a supernova, and that is the fate of Betelgeuse. So the movie is correct on this point. Alpha Orionis will go supernova. But they immediately start getting stuff wrong. Betelgeuse isn't going to explode in the next 100 million years, as the professor says. It's going to explode in the next 100,000. The star only lives for 10 million years to begin with. Now, you'll notice that's a pretty long span of time. Why can't we say with more accuracy? Why can't we say, as he does in the movie, it'll explode on Thursday? Well, first of all, we don't understand the internal physics well enough to make those kind of predictions, but it also may not be possible. At this point in the star's lifetime, it's almost like two objects. You have this compact core where all those nuclear fireworks are going on, and then you have this massive extended envelope of gas. In the case of Betelgeuse, it is 700 times the radius of the sun. And so when changes go on in the core of that star, it takes time for those changes to move out through the atmosphere of the star to the surface where we can see it. In the final stages of a star's lifetime, these changes will be happening on a scale of days, maybe even hours. That's not enough time for us to see it, and that's why we can't predict supernovae, and why it may never be possible to predict a supernova like he does in this, in this movie. Now, a few years ago, a lot of people got excited because Betelgeuse got kind of faint, and some people thought that meant it was going to go supernova. It turned out it was just dust in its atmosphere. So you can't actually look at a star and say it's going to go supernova. We don't know them that well, and it may not fundamentally be possible. Now, one other thing to note. When they say they're looking at Alpha Orionis, that makes one of the first lines of the movie wrong. One of the first things Matthew Broderick's character says is, let's move to 23 hours and five minutes. That's a coordinate. The sky has coordinates, just like the surface of the Earth does. Instead of latitude and longitude, though, what we have are what we call right ascension and declination. Right ascension is the east-west, declination is the north-south. You can imagine as though the Earth were enclosed in this giant crystal sphere, and the stars and the planets and the uh, galaxies were embedded in that sphere. And right ascension declination tell us where on that sphere we can find any object. And this allows us to point our telescopes where we want to go. And during the day where there's no guide stars, you would have to point pretty precisely. 2305 is not the right ascension of Betelgeuse. It's about six hours away. Betelgeuse would not be overhead. It would be on the horizon. And so they, they immediately make the first line of the movie wrong. Now, this actually does give us a timestamp, though, for when this movie is taking place. As the Earth moves around the sun, the stars change. You'll note there are winter constellations and summer constellations. Sometimes Orion is overhead, sometimes it's not. That's because the sky is changing. The right ascension that is overhead at midnight or noon or six o'clock in the afternoon changes by about four minutes a day. And so at noon, 23 hours overhead would mean this movie is taking place, or at least starting, in March. Alpha Orionis were about to go supernova. There would be silicon flashes. There would be no emissions. Even in daylight, we would be able to see. You predicted this? Silicon flashes aren't a thing. It's true that silicon would ignite inside of the stars shortly before a supernova, but you wouldn't see a flash. There wouldn't be something visible because, again, the star is very large. It takes time for that to move out. In fact, the one thing we do sometimes talk about is helium flash. When helium ignites in the core of a star, it may go up very suddenly, but that's more of a theoretical construct. We can't even see that in small stars. So silicon flashes you would not be able to observe. Now, what he says about neutrinos is, however, accurate. We would detect those, in fact, before we saw the light of the supernova. When a star collapses and explodes, it takes time for that explosion to get going. It doesn't immediately start blowing up. However, neutrinos don't have that problem. Now, what are neutrinos? Neutrinos are tiny particles of almost zero mass, but they do have mass. They're subatomic particles that are produced in nuclear reactions. When a star's core implodes, it creates an unthinkable number of neutrinos. But these go right through the star's atmosphere. Unlike the mass, it goes right through because neutrinos, by definition, don't interact very much with matter. In fact, by the time I finish this sentence, trillions will have passed through your body and you won't have even noticed. 
So those neutrinos can go right through. We have very sophisticated observatories that detect cosmic neutrinos and would have detected supernova early on. In 1987, a star exploded in the Magellanic Clouds, 186,000 light years away. And the neutrinos from that explosion actually hit the Earth several hours before the light did. Neutrinos don't move at the speed of light, but they move very close to it. So we would see them very quickly uh, if a star exploded. So if Betelgeuse did go up like a Roman candle, and it's so close, much closer than the Magellanic Clouds, I would expect every neutrino observatory on Earth to light up like a Christmas tree. Now this might be why they're observing during the day. There's very little you can do with an optical telescope during the day. But if Betelgeuse were to go supernova, you would be able to see it. You actually probably would be able to see it if you knew exactly where to point, even if it weren't going supernova, because it's one of the brightest stars in the sky. But if it did go supernova, you would first see it with the telescope, and then you would see it with the naked eye. It would actually get brighter than the full moon. Historically, nearby supernova have been some of the most well-observed events in human history. Ancient astronomers have recorded for over 2,000 years the appearance of what the Chinese called guest stars and what uh, Enlightenment astronomers named new stars or novi, new stars that would appear in the sky, be visible for several weeks, and then fade away. We didn't know what they were, but they were regarded as amazing portents. These were recorded in monastic records, in the Book of Han. They were recorded in petroglyphs. So these were very significant events. There's a lot we can say about supernova, but we'll, I think we'll leave it at there. But if Betelgeuse did go off, it would probably be the event of the millennium. But we've already got another problem here. This is what Betelgeuse looks like. It is in the arm of Orion. That is why it is called Betelgeuse, the hand of Orion. It's not in a galaxy like this. I'm guessing what they did here was they got an image of a supernova in a nearby galaxy and decided that was pretty and put it on the screen. But this is not what Betelgeuse would look like. It just looked like a really honking bright star in the middle of your telescope. You would also not see pulsations like this. It's a fairly continuous rise in brightness. You might see a flash of light early on as the shock wave breaks out from the surface of the star, but that lasts minutes, not seconds, so you wouldn't see pulsations like this. Also, what's going on here? He's looking through the eyepiece of the telescope, but they're also recording electronic images. We generally don't use eyepieces on telescopes, and certainly not on research telescopes. Well, I take that back. I did once look through the eyepiece of the four meter Blanco telescope in South America because I was taking photographic plates and I needed to make sure I was positioned right. So I put an eyepiece in, got my cluster centered and then switched to the photographic camera. Research instruments used to use photographic uh, plates. Now they use electronic cameras. We do this for two reasons. One, photographic plates and electronic cameras are much more sensitive than the human eye to light. And two, you get a permanent record of what you've observed. We need to replicate your results. We need to be able to see the data. And saying, I saw this, doesn't go very far, but having an electronic file that other astronomers can look at it, analyze, is much more useful. So this is a pet peeve of astronomers, seeing people in movies looking through telescopes like it's public night or something like that. That's not what happens. Excuse me, Sam, I know you're busy, but it's almost noon. Noon? Carl, it's almost noon. It's noon, everybody, let's go! Let's go! Let's go. Let's go. Is he smoking in the observatory? Oh, don't smoke. Who are all these people running around like this? They never tell us what Sam's actual job is, but my impression is that he's at a university or a research institute or something like that. There are only a handful of optical telescopes in North America of this size. You have the Roper Science Center in South Carolina, you have the Lowell Observatory, you have the Naval Observatory, UVA, Lick Observatory, and of course, the giant 40-inch telescope at Yerkes. All of these are part of science centers or ed educational institutions. And given that this is a small town, this is probably a small college. In fact, this was filmed at Swarthmore's Spruill Observatory, which has since been shut down. Now, I've worked on a lot of telescopes, and I've specifically worked on big refractors like this, the 16-inch Brashear Telescope at Carleton College and the 26-inch Alvin Clark at UVA. Do you know how many people I needed to assist me? Zero. I would usually have more people there because I was working with students or whatever, but you don't need a giant mass of people like this. A telescope like this can be operated by a single person. Even at national facilities, 
where you have a really giant telescope. It would usually be me and maybe a colleague or two and the telescope operator. Maybe you'd have an engineer pop in at night to make sure everything was working fine. During the day, there's more people around, but they're more, more doing maintenance. But you don't have these masses of people all running around all over the place. And the reason you don't have giant staff like that is because people cost money. It's expensive to pay people. They're the most expensive part of a research grant. So unless Sam is doing a space mission or something, he's not going to be able to keep this staff around. All right, here's the thing. I don't mean to be pedantic or anything, but telescopes are not designed to be pointed at the ground. They are designed to be pointed at the sky. Here's a photo of the Spruill Observatory. And you'll notice that if you pointed the telescope down, you'd be pointed at a wall, not Kelly Preston. Now, some modern observatories do have louvers in their side or fold down or draw back in some way, because we, one of the things we figured out is that classical domes like this, while beautiful, create a heat flow that blurs the image that you get at the telescope. But a classic observatory like this would have solid brick walls. Now you can physically point a telescope down like this for like maintenance or something like that. When I was at Carleton, we, I would sometimes point the brochure down, use a little ship's wheel to roll it over the pier and then point it back up because sometimes it was more convenient to have the telescope on one side of the pier or the other. But if I climb way up and these observatories don't have benches that allow you to climb that high, so you'd have to invent your own, I would have looked into a wall, not into the girl's dorm. I should also point out, being nitpicky here, she should be upside down. Refractors like this will invert images unless you have an elbow or some corrective optics, and this quite transparently does not. So all in all, this scene gets a huge amount wrong. Now there's not a lot of astronomy in the rest of the movie, but there are a few things I thought I'd comment on. One of those is that Sam, when he's spying on his girlfriend, uses a camera obscura to do so. This would actually work, the optics would be quite complicated, but a camera obscura is actually a real thing. Uh, this used to be a attraction at fairs and so forth like that. You can have a little pinhole and it creates an image which is inverted, but he puts an optical element in there, so uh, obviously flips it over. And you, it's passive, so it's just whatever light they're broadcasting is what you see. So that actually could work. There was one little scene I did like where Sam uses these graphs in math to try to prove that his girlfriend is going to break up with her new boyfriend, charting the size of her smile and stuff like that. I like this because he's wrong. There are a lot of scientists who think that human behavior can be predicted like this or mathematized like this, and there's never been any evidence that's the case. So I did like that he thought he could predict what was going to happen, and he was wrong. I like that. There's one other thing, though, that I didn't notice as a graduate student, but now that I'm older and a research professor and have responsibilities, I did notice. What happened to all those people? If you have a lot of employees like that, a lot of people at your observatory, even students, you have responsibilities. Especially in the 1990s, you would have had paperwork and paychecks, letters of recommendation, you need to provide guidance to students. He just disappears. Now it's one thing to go away for a while if you have a family emergency, like your grandmother had a heart attack or something, but to just disappear for weeks or even months to stalk your ex-girlfriend and leave your fellows in the lurch like that, that really rubbed me the wrong way. Nothing else in the movie really compares to the sheer amount of badness in that opening scene, but let's break out the red pen and fix that. Now the rules of the red pen, we can't change the emphasis of the scene, we just try to fix it. And I thought of two ways you could actually fix this. One is that you've already detected neutrinos from Betelgeuse. You know it's going to go supernova. And Sam is so excited about this that he's observing it during the day when it's very hard to use a telescope to try to get the first images of that supernova, which would have been in a major scientific discovery in 1997. So you still have the problem of being at the wrong coordinates and pointing the telescope at the ground and all that, but at least the science is pointed in the right direction. 
But the thing is, the movie implies that this is a daily occurrence, that he's always using the telescopes during the day and always at noon turns down to look at his girlfriend. So how would you work that rather than putting it around a very unique event like a supernova? Well, it's what's one thing you can observe during the day, every day? The sun. Now, before I say this, please do not put a telescope on the sun and put your eye on the other end. The telescope will amplify the light of the sun. You will burn your retina and have permanent vision damage. So do not do that. But if you know an astronomer, they can put a filter over a telescope or even better, project the image of the sun onto a piece of paper. And if you do that, what you will see are little dark spots on the surface of the sun, what we call sunspots. These are places where the magnetic field of the sun pokes through the surface of the sun, making it a little cooler. These were first spotted by Galileo. The cool thing is that you can actually use those spots to track the rotation of the sun and figure out how fast the sun is spinning on its axis. When I was a graduate student, this was a lab we did for students. We had a telescope, we would point at the sun, project onto a piece of paper, and they would sketch the sun, mark where the sunspots were, and over the course of a few weeks, measure the motion of those sunspots and track the rotation of the sun. In this case, instead of having a bunch of research assistants running around, he has a bunch of students and they're doing their lab, and then they all roll their eyes as he says, oh, it's noon, and rips the filter off, points the telescope down, and looks at his girlfriend. And instead of having the big telescope where you're looking at a brick wall, he could be out on the lawn with a small telescope, a Schmidt Cass or something like that, that you would use for a telescope lab. I like this idea for several reasons. One, it would be scientifically accurate. Two, it would show him interacting with students and being devoted to teaching and, and give him a little more character. But three, it would be a better reflection of what astronomers actually do. It's kind of rare that we use telescopes. Even people who do a lot of observing have at most a few weeks on national facilities. And so an observing run is kind of a rare and wonderful occurrence. Most of our time we spend analyzing the data in the computer, writing papers, writing grants, advising students, and so on. And so showing it like this where he's doing a lab for students and then points down to see his girlfriend would not only be scientifically accurate, I think it would be a better impression of what an actual professor's life is like rather than what Hollywood thinks it's like. So hopefully uh, in a couple weeks, I'll have something else for you. But right now, be sure to smash that subscribe button and click the like button. Is that right? Yeah, smash that subscribe button until we meet again. I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Enjoy science, enjoy movies, and enjoy science and movies. And thank you for watching.